Why did I write the book? Well, I, I think the reason is, is I have, for many years, been concerned that how the Buddha is presented and how people have come to see him is as a fascinating individual, a compelling personality, but not quite real. And the reason for this is, in, in the traditional history of Buddhism, from a very early period, more and more mm, miracles or psychic powers were attributed to the Buddha. And when you get to early Sanskrit literature, the beginnings of, um, of Mahayana, this trend increases exponentially. And then when you get to the, the commentaries, even more so. And so traditionally, as monks in traditional countries have um, uh, given talks about the Buddha, as the traditional biographies of the Buddha, like the uh, Lalita Vistara and the Mahavastu, and later on, um, one of the best of them, Ashvagosa's Buddha Charita, the Buddha emerges as a superhuman being. Now, it seems to me that the Buddha was spiritually and psychologically, he was far abo above us, we ordinary samsaric beings. But physically, and in his behavior as he went about his ordinary life, he was pretty ordinary. Now, some people are really shocked to hear that, but he was pretty ordinary. I'll give you one example. In, uh, in traditional Buddhist countries, sometimes I know in Sri Lanka, when a, a, a procession of monks is going down the street, people will put a white cloth for them to walk on, the two of them. So when they're walking on this white cloth, they'll get the last one, and they'll put it in front of the monks, and they'll walk on that cloth, and then so that they'll walk all the way to where they're going on a white cloth. And when they uh, arrive at the house of the person who is uh, offering them dana, the man of the house or the oldest son will be there and they'll wash the monk's feet. It's, it's a nice custom. It's a way of honoring the sangha. But when you read the Tipitika, well, the Buddha actually refused to walk on a white cloth. So, for example, once um, a prince invited the Buddha to his palace for a meal, and he put a white cloth on the stairs, all the way up the stairs. And when the Buddha got there, he approached the, the entrance, but he stopped. And the prince was unaware of what's going on. What's the problem? And three times he asked, and three times the Buddha remained silent. So eventually... Ananda answered on the Buddha's behalf and he said, the Lord won't walk on the white cloth because he's concerned about, because he has compassion for future generations. Oh, so, so the prince rolled up the white cloth and the Buddha walked up the stairs and had his meal. What did he mean by that? Well, I don't know. It doesn't say in the Tibetan, but what I think is the Buddha accepted the reverence and respect that people gave him, and he, did, was, he deserved it. But he didn't like it getting too much. And perhaps he thought that if all this ceremony and special treatment and red carpet treatment is what we would call it today, rather than white cloth treatment, uh, monks in the future might get a little bit too proud. And so to set an example, he decided not to do that. So that's one story. And then the other story is, in quite a few places in the Tipitaka, it simply mentions, as an aside, as a passing comment, that when the Buddha approached a building, before he entered, he'd leaned down and washed his own feet. Now it seems to me that when you read later Buddhist literature, and when you hear people sometimes talking about the Buddha de today, you would think, oh, the Buddha washed his own feet? Oh, 
Do enlightened people do that? Well, yes, certainly the Buddha did. So my point is that in the tradition, the Buddha is elevated far beyond his humanness. And to some degree, that makes him somewhat unreal. When you read how he is described and how he describes himself in the Tipitaka, he comes across as pretty real. So I wanted to uh, go through the Tipitaka, find all these little snippets of information about how he behaved and what he did and what he liked and didn't like, and, and, and present a very human person. And I think that that definitely um, uh, comes across in, in the book. The other thing is, all my life I've been quite interested in the history of India, particularly that part of India where the Buddha lived. I've travelled, including on foot, through some of it, retracing the Buddha's steps, say from Rajaka to Kushinara. I, I, once I went from Buddha Gaya to Varanasi and back again. Uh, so I have some idea of what, was, <laughs> what it might have been like for the Buddha to do that. Of course, things have changed a great deal, but you get at least some idea. Um, and so the second thing I wanted to do was look at what the topographical and ge geological information in the Tipitaka is, so that we can place the Buddha in a particular place. Now, the place he is often depicted in, in traditional accounts of his life, is sort of like walking two feet off the ground, sort of with lotuses on his feet, and um, like spending three months in the heaven realm, and all of which may be true, I, I don't know, that's what they say. But in the Tipitaka, you can see he, he's existing, he's talking, he's living, he's existing in a real environment. And so I have emphasized as much as possible trying to identify the various places that the Buddha visited, uh, how he went from one place to another, how long it may have taken him to walk that distance, the difficulties that he had, um, to, to show that he was not just a real person, but he was a real person within a particular landscape. And that's the other thing that I did, and I think um, the book shows that uh, the information about the landscape that the Buddha existed in is quite credible and, and real. So the result of this was a book that gives the impression of the Buddha as a real existing person. That's what I wanted to do, and I hope I have achieved that.